truth seekers and living in sync with nature. I think that would be our main, most important key points that we will be talking about and discussing throughout this podcast call today. Yeah. But first, let's introduce ourselves. <laughs> right so those of you that perhaps are just hopping on and seeing this video as the first one i haven't seen anything else uh welcome to the unicorn talk podcast um on my anna for rachel you share this in uh in your group still right okay so which is empath unicorn um no warrior <laughs> empath warrior training <laughs> Close enough. Mine is Empath Unicorn Academy, but yours is Warrior uh, Training. Empath yeah, Warrior uh, Training. Yeah. See, I messed that, messed that one up. But um, so we are here to talk openly always. And you'll notice that in any of the videos that we do, any, any of the calls that we do, we talk openly. We talk about the things that some people do not like to hear, don't want to hear. Um, we're not here to point any fingers. We're not here to tell you what you're doing is wrong or what you're doing is right because we believe that there is no right or wrong. Yes, there are certain things that kind of fall more into one category, but at the end of the day, um, there's not, and there's no such thing as good or bad, and yet there is, right? So we're here to talk to those um, that are open to listening right and learning something new um and perhaps you want to contribute to the conversation go right ahead in the comments you can message us you can connect with us uh, maybe one day we can even have uh, a guest speaker on here too Ooh. <laughs> if you want to be one of those uh, reach out to one of us and we can see what we can do about it but other than that let's get right into today's topics mm -hmm. so where would you like to start today yeah well actually your intro led us perfectly into one of our our values our shared values of truth and um so as you were sharing your intro yeah this space is to is a safe space to discuss truth that might be coming through and it might be new resonance that we're feeling um when i feel something to be true at my core i feel a resonance with it is i feel it on a cellular level and there aren't that many space safe spaces within which i feel comfortable and safe being vulnerable enough to share because it is a very vulnerable experience and it from my experience, when I share truth that it disproves or challenges the status quo system of beliefs in any way, I've been rejected or um, silenced, told that what I'm saying is dangerous, told that I'm spreading misinformation, just told all these various, um, you know, methods of silencing and so I'm I'm so grateful for opportunities like this and groups like this because it's always been so confusing for me when I've been silenced I thought well isn't aren't you curious these this is our our entire paradigm here and we as human beings get to choose which paradigm we co-create so if we're in a paradigm that's not working, such as one that violates Mother Earth, violates humanity, wouldn't that be a paradigm we'd really want to explore and get to the core wound? And so that's really what I'm seeking on my truth missions and, and my research. I'm just trying to really get to the core wounds, like what causes the separation that we experience and what seems to be the motive for controlling populations the way that we're being controlled and yeah so just exploring that truth and, and seeing all the patterns again it goes back to um that quote 
that we learn in, in part two of Law of Being, that Arthur Schopenhauer quote, where he says, all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. Third, it's accepted as self-evident. Um, so again, that just that ridicule and violent opposition that um, I guess when I think deeply about it, it doesn't, is not as confusing because it is um, confrontational to a lot of the identity. Um, but yeah, so just grateful for a space to just talk about it and say, this is what I've been researching. And if anybody would like to research with me, it's fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, you, um, you made many great points. And one of the uh, points that you made was that um, it takes a lot to speak our truth. Um, and a lot of people don't tend to speak their truth because they're scared. Um, they're scared. A lot of these fears are primal fears from when we were living in caves and, and in tribes. Uh, but at the same time, it still kind of goes on where we have a group of friends, for example, and if you have a different opinion than from the group, you're less likely to express it. Mm -hmm. Most people keep it to themselves for the fear of being kicked out of this tribe because this is my family, this is my tribe, and I will not find another one, right? So being left alone and feeling lonely and feeling misunderstood, um, here's the thing. The only way that any of us are going to be understood is by us speaking our truth, is by us showing up as ourselves, because otherwise people are going to look at you and they're still going to judge you regardless, right? They're gonna see who you are and they're gonna judge you based on how you're showing up. Now, if you're not showing up as your true self, then they're not judging the real you. And I personally would much rather be judged by my, by who I am, as opposed to the persona mm -hmm. of somebody else or somebody that I wish I could be like, which I mean, I, I stopped wishing wanting to be somebody else a really long time ago, because I just want to be myself and I want to be comfortable and happy and experience joy being myself without having the the need and the desire to be somebody else who would be liked by all but here's the other thing nobody in this whole entire world is liked by every single human being everyone has people that they either like them don't like them, can't stand them, and perhaps probably wish they weren't alive anymore, mm -hmm. right? We all have one of these like heavy waiter people <laughs> on us that, that doesn't like us, no matter how much we try. And by paying attention to, um, we're all children, no matter how old we are, right? So if we pay attention to how our children are, how they interact, for example, my daughter, um, she is, she's very sensitive. She is, she's an empath. She wants to help everyone. She wants to give to everyone. And when somebody doesn't like her, she will try to go out of her way. She used to, not anymore. She used to go try to go out of her way to make them like her. So she would be extra nice, extra polite and do things for her. But what happens is that they end up liking her less. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens with us. When I worked at, um, at a corporate job, I used to, certain people, I used to go out of my way to get them to like me. And I've noticed they, it's like they lose respect. Yep. So if we want someone to like us, the best thing we can do is continue to show ourselves and be that person. Like, I'm sure most of us have met uh, someone or have someone at work who who knows what they want who speak up openly and 
comfortably, even if they don't agree with something, they will state their truth and leave it at that without trying to convince anyone. This is it. That's it. Straight facts. If you don't like it, too bad. So sad for you, not for me. And we secretly all admire that person. Yeah. <laughs> We do admire that person and we want to be just like them, but without hurting anyone's feelings. Yeah. Okay. Now those two things cannot fully coexist. Somebody's feelings are going to get hurt, right? If I was worried about uh, everyone's feelings and I, and I am, but not as much as I used to, I am, if I was worried, I wouldn't be doing these videos. I wouldn't be having these conversations because I know it will, um, some of them might upset some people. Some people will not agree with what I say, but I'm not here for those some people. I am here for the other people, right? I'm here for people that that get it, that it makes sense, that it resonates, um, same kind of like vibe and energy and frequency level. So I feel like there was a lot of things coming up for you that seemed like you didn't take oh enough. Of so let's hear them. Oh my gosh, just so much came up. First of all, I want to thank you for breaking it down. The fear of ultimately standing up for one's sense of individuality, um, one, one's sense of our, our own belief systems. I want to thank you for connecting that with the primal fear of being kicked out of the tribe that when we when we get deep in our healing work and we can really heal that core wound um so much can change that's some deep root chakra work and um so and you connected it to approval and that's huge recognizing when we're seeking approval and when we're the words that are coming out of our mouths, the be the beliefs that we are regurgitating or perpetuating are actually um, not coming from our authentic selves, but a continuation of what's been taught to us or programmed into us. That's when we can really start figuring out who we are. And I can I can offer an example of a moment where I recognized that I was doing that. I was just regurgitating what the tribe was, was, um, was saying, just repeating the talking points. We even see it in the media. Um, so for me, this was around the, uh, it had to do with politics. I normally don't like bringing up politics, but it is such a, I mean, I've been learning more the past four or five years about our identities as individuals and politics, especially because America, like many systems, is a two-party system, which reduces us into binary options. And binary options create a right, wrong, good, bad mentality. So politics is that is a way to um, really show, like highlight, that's what happens on a mental in the mental realm, like our beliefs start thinking in terms of I'm right, they're wrong. And that's where so many of our beliefs end up separating us and creating conflict in relationships. And um, so I was witnessing how, you know, my younger cousins back in 2015, 2016 had um, very progressive political views. And then the um, older generations, the baby boomers were more centrist. And I was talking with my cousin and I repeated a sentence that I heard my dad say. And in that moment, as it was coming out of my mouth and I was looking at my cousin's eyes, I could see my cousin's face like he was in disbelief that I was you know, participating in, in the status quo that I, his cousin was perpetuating the status quo to him. And I, so I remember looking at his face, hearing these words coming out of my mouth and then feeling this separation of spirit so much so that after I was, we were, you know, had left the family event and I was alone again, I had to sit with myself and I was like, that did not feel good. That did not feel authentic and that did not feel aligned. 
So what was going on there? And I sat with it and I realized that my beliefs were actually way more aligned with my cousins than with the, the baby boomers and, and older generations. And then I, ha I sat further and, and really figured out what was I afraid of? Why was I just reciting this, this same programming that had been told to me? And it all came back to approval, wanting the approval of, you know, my, my parents, my, the, these other people in my family. And, um, and so that, that approval can be such a, um, like juicy or, you know, there's so much in there. When we recognize that we want someone's approval, there's a lot in there to dig into. And so you mentioned your daughter being an empath. And I think that that's, while being an empath is so beautiful because we are so giving and loving and we have all this energy to give to others and do for others, it can be some of the motivation coming from that can be for the purposes of being liked. And that can be because being liked is safe because we are so sensitive, we know when people don't like us, they might abuse us, use harsh language, smear our names around, um, you know, launch campaigns against us. And we've all probably been hurt by that kind of behavior. So it can be really easy to fall into those patterns of people pleasing, especially when we see people like I'm imagining your daughter now in school and thinking about like, okay, who are the intimidating girls at school who, who use in, intimidation to get people like me, like, like your daughter to um, either like do their dirty work or you know, whatever it was that they needed. Like I've, I've definitely been in that position as a teenage girl of wanting to make the popular girls happy and being afraid of upsetting them because of the power uh, um, that they, they carried. So yeah, approval. Um, yeah, that's some of what, what came up for me as you were. Yeah, and, and approval, because I wrote down uh, approval is draining. Because mm -hmm. in, in hearing you uh, talk how approval um, I get your interpretation, your understanding, your experience with approval, um, and your knowledge of approval, that is what I was feeling that that approval is very draining because it's seeking external validation outside of ourselves, having somebody else. So this is what my daughter used, uh, used to do. And I mean, she still does once in a while, but it's slowly changing. Um, and anyone who has daughters, um, uh, chances are they've, they've done this as well. Uh, looks in the mirror and then looks at me and says, mommy, am I pretty? And I used to answer that question. And then I stopped answering. I said, I'm not answering that question anymore because I already gave you the answer. And then I thought, how about you turn that question into a statement that starts with I am followed by the truth and then say that to me. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what she started doing now. Instead of saying, mommy, am I pretty or mommy, am I beautiful? Mommy, oh, do I have nice hair? Mommy, do I have nice skin? And all of these superficial things. Right. And she's only 11. I wasn't into that kind of stuff until like 15, 16. So it's a lot for parents to deal with right now. Um. And it, it definitely is challenging because it, it really breaks my heart every time I hear her say things like that. Oh, mommy, am I fat? Like, no. Uh, so she started turning that into an I am statement, right? And then uh, my son gets to witness that as well. And she knows that I, I want to hear her her speak about herself confidently without seeking approval from outside external sources um because this all comes from school as well somebody said something at school and all of a sudden she they would come home and they wouldn't talk to us about these things 
right? And I would want her to, but at the same time, I don't because the reason why kids don't talk about these things is because they need to work through things on their own. They need to understand it, process it, internalize it, and work through it on their own, and then come to us um, if they're not able to. Right? It's very important for kids to do things on their own. Um, so that is that's at the heart what approval really is and here's the thing most of us don't have parents that help you as a child to turn that question into a statement uh, most of us don't have parents who doing their best to let go of control Control is a pretty, pretty big, broad topic. So we're not gonna dive deep into it now because it's a huge one. Control is at the core of pretty much uh, everything. Um, and the way that we're living right now is controlled by outside uh, sources as well. <laughs> so, um, but once we let go of that need to control the outside world and how the outside world sees us or perceives us, um, and us wanting to control how they see us and how they perceive us and what they think of us, that is when we gain the ultimate control of our internal world. Once we let go of the external attachments to, um, to other people and other people really and their expectations and their thoughts of us. So, that is my extension of the approval and the seeking the approval and how draining it is because when we continue to search for that external approval for ourselves, we will continue to do that. And the key is to find it from within and give it to ourselves and not ask for permission from somebody else and ask them to give it to us, right? That's what really happens in, the, in that approval state where we're asking them, are you okay with this? But they're, they're not living in here. We're the ones living in here. So we're the ones that need to give ourselves the approval and validate ourselves from within without asking anyone else, right? They're doing that themselves. So let them do that, but show them how it's best done. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing that that switcheroo that um you and Mila experience of just that question um like for I know for so many parents part of the attachment and control to their children's journey is to protect them I know with my, with my parents when anytime I felt shame uh from being silenced if I that with it and thought deeply, I would realize, oh, they think that they're protecting me because if I go out into the world speaking like this, then the world will punish me as opposed to my parents punishing me. And um, and so everybody, that's just to you know mention, everybody's doing their best. Um, love to all parents, everyone's doing their best and um, parents don't know you know, something as, as simple as answering your daughter's questions. Yes, you're pretty. Um, parents don't know that something like that could start a pattern of external validation seeking that never ends. So that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that and, and teaching an 11 year old how to internally validate. Um, I got, I started tearing up when you shared that, you know, one of the questions is, am I fat? I got 11 years old, it's just, man, I couldn't imagine raising teenage girls or boys right now, young, young men and women, because of how much is available on the internet. And I didn't have, when I was 11, I, the access to perfectly shaped women uh, was through magazines and movies you know i didn't see it constantly on instagram yeah so yeah instagram and social media have really complicated this um 
the, the search for internal validation. And so it takes that much more work now. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and it just, it reminds me of a something that a friend said to me when I was really struggling with my family, going through a, a lot of upheaval because of the path that I chose and what I perceived to be rejection and um, alienation from my family. I was fixated on a lot of the things my people in my family were saying and I couldn't let it go. It was so connected to trauma. So a lot of, when we experience trauma, it replays in our emotional right brain, just on a loop. And one of the reasons I love finding the value in the journey is because it does have the power to move the trauma to the left brain where we can analyze it and evaluate it from the perspective of, oh, well, had that never happened, I never would have you know, created empath warrior training, for example. Um, had I never had that relationship that, that alerted me to the need for this kind of medicine. Um, so anyways, I was, I was dealing with these trauma loops and a friend broke them. She just paused them by saying, she just looked at me and said, why are you listening to the, the opinions of people you don't trust? And that floored me for a couple of reasons. One, I was like, yeah, uh, why am I? And two, do, do I trust my family's opinions? I guess not. Like, do you know, like they haven't led me anywhere um, authentic. They've, they've led me where I receive the most approval. <laughs> sure. Uh, but that didn't work out for me internally. Um, and, and then it expanded beyond there of, do I trust anybody's opinion really? Because none of us really know what we're doing. So when, if we stop and think about it, nobody knows what we're doing. Um, if I, my ideal world, we'd all be walking around pointing at each other, being like, you exist, I exist. That's crazy, we all exist and just be celebrating existence and creation all day, every day. Um, and so until, until we get there, why trust anyone other than our own intuition? Um, so yeah, that question was just immediate um, medicine and, and it helped me to really determine, am I designing a life based on approval from others? In which case it would be the life they would want for me, which has nothing to do with me, or am I designing a life born from my authentic spirit, which might disrupt some attachment to my journey. And that's why we have tools, healing, healing tools to deal with that. Yeah, I, I almost wonder if how much of our parents and our grandparents words and actions have to do with traditions and trying to pass on these traditions um, and how a lot of children are having a lot of attachment to traditions and not wanting to change those traditions as they grow up um, until one day they don't really feel like that's them anymore and this is where the, the struggle tends to happen as well. And for those of you that might perhaps uh, been in that moment where you want to follow traditions and you don't want to break them, and yet you do because it's, it's not really you and you feel kind of like stuck, um, or if it's going to happen, there's a quote that I heard. And I really, really love it. When I heard, I was like, oh my God, this is genius. Uh, tradition is peer pressure from dead people. Because that's what happens when we follow traditions and then all of a sudden we don't want to anymore and we feel pressured to continue to follow because if, this, if we stop this tradition, it's going to be lost forever and ever. Again, that's not the truth. It might be true for this generation, but 
why not allow new traditions to take place, new traditions to happen? And when we feel that dissonance, I guess is the word that comes to mind, that, that disconnect between this is tradition um, in my family, but it's not mine. You feel pressure to continue to follow it. What do you do? Yeah. I can't tell you what to do, but all I can say is you listen to yourself and do what you feel is the right thing to do right um, um i'll be right back i just have to pee <laughs> i was gonna say sitting down like almost you have to go pee and do a little dance so while she's gone uh there was um, a video that I, I like to do screen record on my phone and uh there was a video on here that i recorded um let me see I, I was wondering if I should like play it or not. I was gonna keep it for another time, but now that Rachel went uh, to the bathroom, I thought that maybe I will rewind it to the beginning. It's only like 59, 29 seconds, actually not even 29 seconds because I just recorded a little small part, small part of it. So uh, what I'll do is I'll turn this up all the way so you guys can hear an Abraham Hicks exact words. Um, what she was talking about um kind of like the internal inner inner battle that so many of us have when it comes to change um so here i'll play it hopefully you're gonna hear some i'm gonna play like a little clip that i did a screen recording of it's really really good to you but i don't need to be scared like i used to be like oh i'm crazy and I liked myself for being crazy because it was fun. It was innocent. But now I you know what the definition of crazy is? Crazy is following one's own guidance when the population at large wants you to follow the conditions that they've laid out for you. That. And I thought, I'm like, oh, my God. And I was talking about change because, you know, changing ourselves and fatigue. Uh, listening to our internal compass, listening to our intuition and being our authentic self. Um, and most people will call people that are living their truth and living their life authentically crazy. Yeah. And yeah. when I heard that, I'm like, oh my God, I need to record this part because this is amazing. I think that's how you and I connected immediately too in, in the space of the heart because we found each other in an empath group and then we were immediately talking about gifts, like visions, dreams. And we were the, you were the safest space for me to share. And because everywhere else I was literally told I was crazy. Like my, even my therapist, you know, like I'll never forget, I, you and I had this beautiful Zoom session one day, and then I went straight to therapy after, and I was so high from our session. And then in therapy, she asked me, you know, what brings me joy? What do I enjoy doing? And I said, um, I said, share dreaming with friends. And she went, okay, so let's share dreaming. And then was like, I was like, you know, like when you and a friend uh, receive similar downloads or wisdom from source. And I, I started talking like that, thinking, because I was looking around her therapy office. She had the like chakras going up, like decorations. And I was like, oh, cool. She gets it. Um, but apparently not. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate that because it, it, I mean, now that I've, that we've been speaking the way we speak for years and I've, I've um, come into beautiful sacred union with so, so many soul, like my like-hearted souls, um, I forget that loneliness and um, fear of, of being a crazy one and just how ostracized and, um, ostracize ostracizing it could be and so thank you for reminding me and the community whoever is viewing this that it sucks being told you're crazy 
when you're speaking straight from your intuition, like the, the truth, like we can trust our intuition as truth. Um, you know, sometimes it, our intuitive signals might shift and change, but for the most part, those signals know and we deserve to speak it. And anytime we're told that it's not safe to speak, it is almost like being told you're not worthy of your existence because the essence of who we are when we speak at that level is being rejected. Yeah, and I actually used to cry when people called me crazy. It used to make me so upset, so I, I would do anything I can to get people to like me, right? Um, and, and I really quickly recognized that this is not who I am. This is not who I ever was. This is not who I was born to be. Um, and I didn't even know how that happened that brought me to that place. I mean, I do, but it's a really long story to get into it uh, because it's not just one specific thing. It's just little bits and parts and pieces. Um, it's just the journey itself. So we don't have 30 years to sit here and discuss this. <laughs> really. I would love to. <laughs> yeah, sit here with me. <laughs> me too. Um, but now when I'm being called crazy, I say, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Because my understanding of crazy is, is this, because when I heard that, I'm like, Ooh, this is just like the cherry on top of what I already know. Um, the world we're living in was built by crazy people. And that quote that you said earlier, that all truth goes through the stages. Yeah. It's into that crazy part, right? Cause in the beginning you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy. And then anger is involved in there. You're insane and crazy. And then, huh, maybe you're not crazy. Maybe there is something to your crazy. Yep. And then they believe it. And that's just our karmic path as empaths. It, it's really helpful to get used to it because empaths are born from a higher dimension. And I don't mean dimension as like a physical place. I mean a, a, a vibrational vortex. So in the work we do with energy work, we talk about expanding and contracting. Empaths were born from that expanded place mm -hmm. of peace, joy, one love. So we came into this world, and I believe most babies do, come into this world in that place with access to it, direct access to what was just beyond the veil for us. Um, and, and empaths just have this divine intolerance to blocking it. A lot of us can block it as soon as we enter this world. Empaths can't. Um, I've tried with alcohol and Adderall and all sorts of pills. I try to block it, but as you said, it wasn't me. And the reason I was blocking it was because I kept being told I'm too intense. I'm too intense. I ask too many questions. I think too much. Yeah. And, too, um, sensitive. <laughs> too sensitive. Too sensitive. Yep. Oh, too sensitive. Yeah. And um, and really, and it would always be so confusing because what I thought that I was getting to was that place that felt like home, that place of oneness and connection and intimacy. So and that's where empaths, like we, the reason that when we meet like-hearted people and like and, and other empaths and immediately just start going deep is because that is our home. Small talk is very difficult for us. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's just not natural for us. It's natural for so many other people. It's not natural for empaths. No, it causes me anxiety. Same, same. It, yeah. I, I like, well, he, I'll, dis I'll either disassociate or I'll hear myself trying to convince myself to say something so I sound normal. Um, <laughs> and, then it, and then it just gets weird looks because it's yeah. like, how about that football game? You know, like whatever it is. And everyone's like, you know, you, you, 
I don't know. Um, but yeah, so we're from that that place, and then we're in we're navigating this world where people use a lot of harsh language and just harsh behaviors in general, a lot of force and coercion. And for empaths, that is just so it is pretty shocking. And it can shock our systems into silence. And we learn that pretty quickly. Um, that's how we learn how to people please so quickly and learn how to fawn because it's pretty new. Like coming into this world and being silenced harshly, harshly rejected, abused in any way, it's pretty shocking and new to the, to an empath who comes for comes here for love. <laughs> like essentially, that's why we're here to love and celebrate and enjoy ceremony and intimacy and and oneness. So yeah, learning these um, these phases of truth is really helpful and also learning having some kind of gauge or barometer of your own um the gap in time between the moment something becomes apparent to you as an intuitive and then when it becomes starts becoming apparent to others that can help to at least develop some kind of patience or even making it a game like okay this was apparent to me four years ago now it's just becoming apparent to my family and using that as as safety a lot of times it can be easy to resent family or want or want to prove um like i know things that are becoming apparent to my family just now that i said four or five years ago and was rejected for it i have this internal this inner child who wants to be like remember i could pull up emails and where you were yelling at me for saying this and now you're saying the same things you know just a lot of attachment to that past yeah and what's really helping me to move forward through it is remembering, you know, that these are just the natural stages. It was never my point to prove anything in the first place. It was just my desire to be able to express, which I can now, about these topics at least. There are some coming in the in the shoot that are a bit of a struggle right now. And so in four years, I'll feel safe talking about those. But yeah, so just recognizing. <laughs> how much time it takes and using that either turning it into a game or um or just like just remembering the stages that truth goes through as safety uh because there's not yeah it, it's really important to learn how to speak the truth we like we prefer to speak while navigating the rejection the ridicule that we're gonna yet or it's just our karma we're gonna be we're gonna be ridiculed and opposed <laughs> yeah i mean we we in a way do it to ourselves as well by holding what we want to say what we want to speak the topics that we want to cover um we're doing that to ourselves we're suppressing our true self mm -hmm. right yeah. um and that's not the way that any of us were born to actually be living our life each and every one of us was born to we're not a copy of each other right we're not a copy of each other we are we are so different each and every one of us is so different and that we, even identical twins they're not identical you know what i mean they are maybe a mere image of, of themselves right but they're not identical they have their own personalities they have their own thoughts they have their own re realizations and assumptions and all the experiences they might be sharing it but the way that if we're let's say both you and i are sitting down on on the beach on the sandy beach and and just enjoying the water and the sky and everything around us we're in the same place with the same experience and yet we experience it differently. And if you have a beach full of people, each and every person will be experiencing that same exact place and, and thing a different way. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I believe it's because 
that that's the way that they were meant to experience. That's the way that they were meant to see everything around them. Some people might not even notice that there's clouds in the sky, while others be like, oh my God, clouds. And while another person, oh, that cloud looks like this, like that, like this, right? And other people are looking down on the ground, looking down at the sand. And did you know that they say that there's as many planets out there or universes, I guess, um, as much as there is the grains of sand on planet Earth? That's another conversation, right? That a person would have on the same beach. And somebody else would be just upset and angry at themselves or the kids or another person. And this happens quite often with, with women, especially. They would be in their head about their body image. Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, how much? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how much, how much enjoyment or potential enjoyment women sacrifice. I'm sure men do too. I don't mean to leave men out, but just how much enjoyment we have sacrificed worrying about our body image. A Thank lot. You. That just, that just really hit. Yeah, a lot too, way too much time worrying about our body image and our, our appearance. Yeah. But you, you brought up, I mean, I love this point um, because I do believe that we are awareness having a human experience. And so the point is to create these different perceptions of the world so we can get to know what everybody's perception is. And one person, like I was thinking about this because I have my IPEC education Chris has his meditation education that he's beginning now. And, and I was thinking, this is so cool because one person can't possibly um, thoroughly educate in, in all these modalities at once. So it's so cool to have a community because each community member offers something different and we can learn more efficiently that way. And so while there's also, of course, the um, disadvantages to having all these, these perceptions and that it does create so much misunderstanding and misunderstanding inevitably leads to pain. Um, there, there is so much opportunity within that misunderstanding to get to know the lens of awareness through another human being and hopefully all find our way back home to the soul by having the curiosity and patience and tenderness and compassion to get to know what everybody's experience of the world is because it, it's going to be different like as you said this this world was designed our current paradigm was designed by crazy people like sociopaths you know like <laughs> like we we were talking about racism earlier <laughs> racism wouldn't exist if this world wasn't designed by sociopaths and psychopaths who don't value each and every life as sacred. So, um, forgot how I got started on that. <laughs> <laughs> that I hear separation, right? That we are one, no matter what color of the skin or hair or eyes we are, we are one. We are the same and yet the inside like the, the way that I see the inside of us is the universe itself and I and I, I I do tend to look down or look somewhere else when I when I kind of visualize the inside um it's like there's a solar system there's planets there's stars there's mechanisms there's bacteria there's everything in there that's happening and they're not even aware of what that they're inside of us. And most people are not aware that they are inside of this universe. Mm -hmm. And then we might actually be inside of another universe. And you know what I mean? It's like in the, when um, uh, Horton Hears a Who, that's a really good, uh, anybody watched it with their kids, really great, uh, but they're really living on a speck on a dust speck and that's the whole entire world and for all we know that's us mm -hmm. right and some of us are allowing ourselves to embrace the crazy so to speak 
and question the status quo, question why do things have to be this way? Why can't they be this way? And not only question, but, but explore it. Mm -hmm. and then see what they can do to shift it or change it or how they can improve it or add to it yeah right that's how lights were created that's how this laptop was created this internet that we're speaking through and you listeners or viewers are listening or viewing us from it was created by crazy people and guess what they are and they were just like you and I. The only difference is that they were brave enough to embrace, the, embrace their crazy. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that they weren't scared because bravery would not exist without the fear. They were scared probably every single day. Yes. I see fear, anxiety, but they were brave enough to say, yes, fear, yes, anxiety. I hear you, understand you, but I know that there's something in there. And it's not like they actually know, they just sense and, and they know on the inside that there's something to it. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to keep going and going and going until I find out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that's coming up for me is, um, so, I mean, it's, it's, there's a long history of persecution for inventors and people who are considered crazy. Um, who are who are geniuses who are creating innovations for everyone's benefit like you know Galileo was even persecuted and now we accept his truth as as our truth and um and so something that's coming up is there must be a confrontation with our own mortality when we decide to say yeah. I'm going to go ahead and speak my truth or move forward anyways. I know that I'll be ostracized and that's okay. And I think it brings us back to your or original point, that fear of being kicked out of the tribe and that, that primal fear. Like, yeah, back in the caveman days, if we were on our own, if we did get kicked out of the tribe and we're on our own, we would probably die because we wouldn't have the, the fire and the food to keep us alive, the warmth of the tribe, um, the the cognitive diversity of a tribe. Um, and yeah, now it seems like cognitive diversity is punished among a tribe. Um, but yeah, so it is really deeply related to that primal fear of death. And I think, I know when I first went live, for example, going live on Facebook, I felt like I was gonna die. And then I did it. And then I remember being like, oh my God, that like saying all these things to myself, like that was terrible and coming up with all the reasons why it was so bad. And then this thought form, it's a firm voice came through and it just said, yeah, but did you die? And I was like, oh no, I didn't. I'm look, I guess not, I'm still breathing. And that's been a very helpful um, recognition anytime I'm going to do something that brings up that same fear because it does fe feel like the fear of persecution. Like, yeah. if I show up, they're gonna, you know, that's it for me, curtains. Um, and so just having, yeah, really coming to terms with our own mortality and saying to myself, you know, I didn't come here to make it out alive. I came here to be an empath warrior. I'm gonna be a warrior. I gotta learn how to speak up and say hoka hey and march into battle no, ma no matter what and just trust. It takes a lot of trust that is worth the ripple effect and, and that's for each person to decide. It's an individual choice to decide is my, is my expression is the ripple effect that my expression has or is the the love of it you know a lot of creative people who are doing it for the love of it you know is it worth it in my opinion yes always because throughout space and time who do we remember um and you know we who do we val who do we admire you know the creative people the philosophers um the the people yeah who like Einstein and the people who who made 
differences in our lives because they challenge the status quo. So yeah, I'll, I'll always root for it and always believe it's worth it. It does, it does come with that kind of warrior mentality though, that training. Yeah, it definitely does because it's not it's not for the faint of heart. And we um, anyone that starts going through the changes, right? Because it's it's a process and it, it is a roller coaster, up and down, up and down. There's good days, there's bad days, and there's really, really, really bad days. Um, and that's what any creator goes through. And it they continue to go after it because of this silent pull towards it like that that's how i would describe it it's like this there's something there it's like when you close your eyes and you try to you put your hands in front of you long enough you'll feel like there's something there that somebody's gonna grab your hand and pull you that's what that it, it feels like where you know that you, what you're doing is for a reason it has a purpose even though you don't see it yet but it's almost like you're blindly going in because you are all of us are going in blindly because if we weren't going in blindly then we would know exactly what was kind of happening um, and that is really part of life a, a baby is born not knowing where it's where, where it's going what life it's gonna have right um i mean i also believe that they do the soul does right but once it goes through the birthing canal a lot of that connection to the previous um choices that they've chosen to come into this world um to experience this this and this and this and that and everything is already pre-planned out so that's where the sense of knowing comes from to my understanding is that we um like that blind pull is like, it, it almost says like, yes, you are on the right path. Yes, you are going in the right direction. Just keep going. And of course, you're going to have tests. You're going to have tests coming into your into your field, into your life in many different ways. It's going to come from inside of you. It's going to come from outside of you, right? Those are the, the two ways, inside and outside. And you do have a choice to continue going and work through the muck or stop and quit and always feel like you you're missing something mm -hmm. most of us that continue to keep going that sense of i'm missing something starts to disappear because we move in a direction that our soul was designed to move now also if you are that person that has given up and you are now in a place where you feel like you're missing something that was part of your journey as well mm -hmm. because you, perhaps you might not have wanted it bad enough and that's why you deviated deviated from it for a moment and it is a moment even though it might be a couple of years it's still just a moment in, in, the, in the span of time and, and the, in the world and um and everything it's just for a moment that you deviate from your soul's plan but that was also part of that because uh there was um in the law of being there was this uh story that really 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 resonated with me and i still remember to this, this day and i hear it very often um it's about the master his guru when uh the you know uh sorry not the the this the set the senate or and and his master but he wanted to uh, know about enlightenment and he kept and uh, the guru kept telling him to you, you know which i'm talking about right so um i don't know if i want to give the story away now <laughs> yeah. but it, it's a really 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 great story i don't um how do I, I'll, I'll just do this for the sake of time as well. When this, uh, this, this descendant, not that the descendant, um, when the student wanted to reach enlightenment, wanted to have a light, wanted to know what it was, uh, the master kept putting his head under the water, get, getting him to put his hand under the water um, and, and then he would come out and still ask what is enlightenment. So in the very last time when he, the master told him to put his head under the water, 
um, and he held his head under the water for long enough. And then he finally emerged from the water and he asked, why did you do that? Right. And the master asked him, what did you want most in that moment? Right. When you were underwater, what did you want most? His response was, I wanted to breathe. So when you want enlightenment, as bad as you want to breathe, that is when you will get it. The same thing goes for anything that we want to have and achieve in our life. And the reason why that story stuck with me so bad is because what I wanted is I wanted to experience joy and happiness. And I just wanted to feel alive again. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that going through the law of being, I broke down crying and I needed to break down in order for me to rebuild myself, to come up with this new um, awareness that that's what I want. And I want it so bad. And that's why I'm going through all of these changes in my life. And because I want it as bad as breathing, that's why I'm getting it into my life. And that's why it's here in my life now, because I wanted it as bad as breathing. So that's what it, it kind of is. It's like this, this silent pull towards whatever it is that we want to, to have, do, and achieve. But it's not something outside of us that motivates us. It's something inside of us. The outside of us, it, it's almost like all of that is a test of how badly you really want it. Yeah. yeah. And there, there is no clear answer it becomes clear as you embark on the journey um i know that when we were brainstorming for our i am enough workshop a couple comments were were in my in my field um a couple comments that i received on facebook that i wanted to somehow address through our program. And they're pretty similar. One comment was someone reached out, interested in coaching, wasn't clear on what she wanted coaching for. She just said, I just know I meant for so much more. And that's enough to begin. The journey. Yeah. Just knowing you're meant for so much more. I think every empath can relate to that there's this silent call for calling empath forward that we were meant so much more than to per perpetuate patterns of the status quo. And then another comment I received was, I just feel like I have so much more to offer the world. And that really stuck with me. So kind of similar, just two different, you know, one, um, one is just, I mean, they're both so beautiful, the intention behind those um, those calls and the way they were worded, they just really hit me like, oh, this is someone being called forward, you know? Yeah. And um, however long it takes, like someone might feel that for a lifetime that I met for so much more. And it's just, it's never too late. Like you can be a hundred years old and wake up one day and decide to you know speak truth or whatever it is whatever the call is it, it, it's never too late um obviously we have an advantage of having a maybe wider impact um or just more time if we start young but you never know maybe you know the the ceo of a major bank could wake up at you know, older in life and decide to use the power of the bank to create a better world. We never know. So yeah, there those calls forward are it's always worth exploring and you don't have to know. It's a mysterious process. I had no idea that I was going to become a coach. I had no idea I was an empath when I began, you know, it's you just <laughs> you just start somewhere you just start exploring I think I just started exploring me like what am I why am I so different and that led to where I am today just that why am I so different um, yeah everybody call me names <laughs> <laughs> I would also add that a lot of people including myself um when the journey starts 
and the journey starts with the feeling when we feel lost mm -hmm. disoriented confused and starts to question who am i what am i for i feel like i have a purpose and that feeling of unfulfillment mm -hmm. and very many people um are following the system the way the system is designed. So I know we, we've talked about the system and the way that is designed many times in many different ways, but here's how the system was designed. Designed. You're born, your parents take care of you, you go to school, you sit in the rows, um, in, in rows and in lines, the rows each different way. You learn the stuff that you don't necessarily need as you grow up, but it does teach you a lot of skills as well, but not as many as you need to actually go out there and um, and start the job of your dreams. Um, then you, as you're going through school at a certain age, uh, you need to get a job because you need to learn how to have a job and, and multitask balancing uh, personal life, school and a job. Um, and then as you go, it's time to now get married and have children. Things are changing. So sometimes people are having children without having to get married um, or having children on their own without having a partner, right? And um, and then when you, there's certain stages that you're going. And then when you are at your job, um, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. When you work your way up, a lot of people find that when they get to that place where they thought, I this is going to be it of this is like the the tip of the iceberg for me this is what i'm going to feel everything i'm meant to feel and quite often it's the opposite where they get to that place where they've been dreaming of and working towards they find themselves feeling unfulfilled mm -hmm. and a lot of those people seek out coaches that help them to work through that feeling and most of these people um recognize that they were looking at things in a different way so they change their viewpoint of from where they are already and they're able to have that sense of fulfillment and live the life that they've been dreaming of in that same place while others recognize I've just been following the steps that were outlaid by somebody else for me. That's not what I even wanted to do because it's not fueling my soul. So they go out and they find what is fueling their soul and live the way that they wanted to live. But at the end of the day, it's not the thing that gives us a sense of fulfillment. It's a feeling from the inside that allows us to have. Mm -hmm. that sense of fulfilling um so it's not necessarily like well, i'm gonna have i'm gonna feel this way when i have this job it's how can you have this feeling now before you have that job yeah i actually it's so interesting that this is coming up because this actually just came up for me with someone who um you know as as we are um approaching more of using lobbying in, in the corporate um, arena ever since we started talking about it I've I've been attracting conversations with people in those corporate places and so this came up with someone who has been very destination focused uh, so focused on the promotions focused on the cars that the money buys the travel that the money buys the houses just um, I, everything that we are taught, the, the carrots that, that are dangled in front of our faces when we um, conform to that program of, you know, get in, get your foot in the door at a good job, work there your life until retirement. And so this, I thought it would be a great medicine to, just as you said, you know, find those feelings before you go for the end result. Um, and this person's concern was, doesn't that teach complacency? And so I thought that was very interesting. We did a little bit of work around it. Um, this person will still have a lot of work to do. Um, this, is a, this is not a person I typically work with, you know, um, people who feel really deeply in empath when we bring up destination addiction and bringing in gratitude for the now, it seems to stick. Um, 
with with this person talking about gratitude for now you know gratitude for something like running water um I, and the, so, yeah, this person had a lot of re resistance to developing a gratitude practice. And um, so, which is great for me to know, you know, I need to work around that. And we'll, we'll go deeper into where that fear is coming from. But so the fear around like, well, doesn't that teach complacency if you're not striving for something more and more and bigger and bigger? And so I imagine, you know, I was grateful that this came up because I had never heard that before. That was the first time I had ever heard someone express that fear. And um, because for a lot of people, um, you know, so we did a little val a, a little work around the value of achievement. And it turned out that this, this person's um, definition of achievement is very much based in what the status quo would tell us that achievement is based in. And therefore, um, based on that definition of achievement, complacency would be um would be enjoying you know the the riches of the moment and of, of the riches of having our basic necessities met so yes very interesting um very i'm glad that this came up because um yeah it'll it'll definitely help me going forward and how to work around or work with this person's value of achievement and what complacency is and how to teach um, destination addiction in a way that it, it will help a lot of people in those corporate positions who have been doing this for years and years based on this belief that the achievement, the recognition, the respect and value comes when you reach that next level in the hierarchy and then getting to the point of being like, why is it never enough? Um, yeah. That's a great point. Like, I like how you, uh, you call the destination addiction because that's what it really becomes. And any one of us who has planned a destination, whether it's job related or vacation related, or children related, personal life related, we look forward to these destinations of when I get to this beach, I'm going to feel like this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Um, it's kind of comes from a place um, of I'll be happy when. I call it a syndrome. I'll be happy when syndrome. Destination addiction, which is looking forward into the future or addiction of, I don't know what it's called, but when you're looking into the past and you're replaying your past stories, because most of us are not living in the present. We're either in the past or in the future. Like If you sit down and pay attention to your mind, you will recognize that your mind is either in the past or in the future. I'm going to go and I'm going to do this. And you're planning a list of what you're going to do. Or I'm feeling this way because of what happened in the past, right? So we're jumping timelines and we're bringing it into the now and we experience it in the now, even though we're not in the future, we're not in the past. So we are addicted to switching, uh, to jumping timelines instead of being here in the moment. And yet we're all going towards one goal of, experiencing joy in our each and every day life but the only time that we actually experience joy is in the moment and here and now yes we can also experience it in the past but we'll bring it in the moment and here and now we can experience it in the future but it still happens in the moment and when we're jumping these timelines we're taking ourselves out of the present moment and we become, like you said, addicted to this, this thing. Um, but here's what I like to do with this um, uh, jumping timelines in the future is to bring it into the moment now and visualize as if it was already happening and and come out of this visualization with feelings and emotions that I would be experiencing then that I'm actually experiencing now. Yep. yep. That's, that's right. Um, <laughs> yep. I get to experience it now. And guess what? After that, I'm like, why would I want to go through all of that unnecessary work 
to go after it, to experience that. And then as I ask that question, there's a lot of realizations come, come through as to why, right? Because that's the fun journey. That's the, that's the fun. And I get to, now that I know what I would feel like when I get there, because I've just experienced it, I get to experience it every single day as I'm going towards that thing. And that complacency fear is actually pretty huge for most people because um, when I've even had conversations with my husband, with a gremlin, right? I'm not enough. And, um, and just saying that I want to hear in all the different ways that I am enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the response is typically the same with anyone that I have this conversation with. Um, but if you know that you're enough, you're not going to want to try to be better. No, quite the opposite happens. When we believe and we know that we are enough, we have anabolic energy. So we are energized and our battery is full and we are excited and we feel joy and we're just so motivated and inspired and driven that we just want more. That becomes an addiction itself in a way that we want more and more and more. So we're not that fear of complacency, it's not a real fear in my experience. And in any one that I've worked with, that's not their experience either. That when we feel that uh, we are enough, we want more and more and more because it feels good and we want more of that good feeling. So we continue going after it. Yeah, it's actually the... I think that what this this person was getting at with the fear of complacency, and I think this is what um, anyone with that fear is actually getting at, it's a, a fear of apathy. And apathy is actually a result of, well, many things, but one of them is shame. And so, and so shame, feeling helpless to make a difference, overwhelm. So all those things we experience when we think that we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And we think, why would I even bother? So that just as you're saying, um, you know, it's the the driver, uh, the driver actually doesn't change the, the driver to achieve. Um, it's still, I mean, the the definition of what achievement might change, but that that drive um it's still there. It's just more with more clarity now. So for example, if someone is chasing after promotions because they believe that a promotion symbolizes respect, what they're really after is the respect. They're not after the, the promotion. So that drive is still there and they will find respect one way or the, another. It doesn't necessarily have to be through a promotion. So it, it's still there. Um, it, yeah, and as, as you were saying, you know, the joy, that gives us more energy. So if we bring awareness to the now and gratitude for what we have in the present, you know, how we can even do an exercise, like, you know, how does it feel right now? Just being grateful for what we've got. And we'll have more energy. And when we're thinking about what we don't have, so if we're thinking thoughts like, oh, I don't have that promotion, I want that promotion, we're actually in, in lack and scarcity. Yeah. So, and, and we actually have less energy. Yeah. I usually, when I feel that way, I want to take a nap. I feel tired. Physically and mentally, I feel tired. Uh, so that's why the nap comes in, because a nap is a way for our body to recharge and re regenerate itself, right? Um, to shed all the linings that we don't need. So, but when I feel like I am enough and I can't do it, it's like um, a, f a breath of fresh air or second wind, as some people call it, or being in a state of flow or in a zone and you're just motivated and inspired and, and you feel like you are, you just climbed Mount, Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. That's, I guess, the feeling. So that's what if we allow ourselves to uh, to believe that we are enough, that we have everything, that we trust ourselves, that is when we get to experience that feeling. But at the moment that doubt or shame 
or guilt or embarrassment among other other many feelings and emotions that drain us come in that is when we feel powerless mm -hmm. yep when we're feeling powerless we're not gonna try because yeah. why bother we'll just fail if we're fear if we're fear feeling powerless we don't think that we have much ability to make any change if we don't think we have that if we're helpless to make if we feel helpless to make a difference how much effort are we really going to put in to trying yeah probably not much i personally don't put very much but i just choose a nap instead okay. yeah <laughs> i'm a nap <laughs> I'm gonna go nap <laughs> or I'm just gonna go sit there and watch Netflix and distract my mind from all the different reasons and ways that I feel like I'm not good enough and I can't do it um, until I feel like I can after I'm done watching all my Netflix shows yep. and usually the opposite happens I, I actually it's so funny you say that I, last night I was like I need to just escape into something because I, I was like I can't be in my mind anymore because we we, we had this very heart opening experience in the retreat and then and in that so we were we were guided to bring up a, a relationship in our lives where there's conflict and but we and we were told like don't choose anyone that where there's trauma it it's got to be more like simple conflict so I brought to mind a friendship that I wanted to send just pure love back and forth. And it turned out there was trauma and um, I didn't know it surprised me. I was like going through it and I was like, why is there resistance? Why is there resistance? Come on heart, just send love. And then, it, um, then I went through and recognized trauma. And then the exercise was done, the retreat was over and it was last night we we're just chilling. And I was spending time in some future where this person and I were having a conversation and I was explaining myself and I was in my mind explaining myself over and over and to a ghost because of course it's, I was sitting on the couch, nobody, this person was not in the room, you know? Um, and so, um, I was experiencing the anxiety that comes from living in the future or creating some imaginary conversation in our heads and trying to like prove something or, or like I could feel my self-righteousness through it and just like wanting justice by having this conversation that's probably never going to take place, let's be honest. And, and I just couldn't and I could feel the addiction as though I was onto something, as though if I just kept having these conversations in my head, I would figure something out. And I could feel that addiction when Christopher spoke and he pulled me out of that conversation. And I was like, how dare, like my, my stress reaction was, how dare you interrupt me? And I'm like, interrupt me? Like, what am I even doing? He's, he just, brought me to the now and be, being brought to the now I felt the addiction to those thought patterns I was like wait I was just I was in the middle of something like what was I in the middle of bizarre human behaviors um but yeah just and then I was like I, then I realized what was happening I was like I need a, an escape from my brain I need to put something on Netflix and just like get into some other world because my brain is not stopping <laughs> that's a great way of well first of all thank you for sharing that experience be and having that conversation with uh the ghost yeah. so to speak, right because a lot of us actually do wish we could have a conversation with people from our past who have hurt us mm -hmm. which does create traumatic experience right whether uh, we are aware of it or not the trauma does occur and when trauma occurs it affects our soul and it hurts right um so when you were as i was listening to you i was able to have my own little moments of awareness of other relationships in my life or with friends of why i was struggling to send love to these people and 
and then when you when you said that why i was struggling to send love to those people i instantly saw the reasons why mm -hmm. and those are the exact same reasons why i would not want to have conversation with those people yeah because they projected so much onto me and made me a villain and and it really 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 hurt me on a personal level and um i i don't i want to say that i don't let people in close to me but that would be a lie because from the beginning when you and i were talking we uh, we started right away into like opening up our heart naked and bare and exposed that's how i always have been and that's how i will always be and that's why it hurts me so deeply when i when I am that way and people don't see it and they call it me playing games yeah. and it's like oh my god are you kidding me and then when I when I learn of the things that they expose themselves to like what tv shows that they watch I'm like oh my god it makes so much sense why you think everyone in your life is playing games because you're watching type of shows where women are playing games and sabotaging one another. So of course you're gonna see that everywhere you look, mm -hmm. which is might be reality TV, but it's not reality that you're living in. But it could be if you continue to, you know, um, project that kind of stuff onto people. It's like becoming a producer of a reality TV show. Like the the drama we see on reality shows are highly produced. Like their their producers getting paid to create that kind of drama, and um, like getting in the the participants or actors. I don't know what you call reality reality stars. Producers yeah. are getting into their heads and being like, oh, you know what so and so is up to? She's trying to like steal your light or whatever um highly produced drama and so when someone is eating fed a diet of highly produced drama they're going to go out into the world and and try to produce their own drama because that's what they you know it's their perception it's what they believe is normal um and it's it's so great that you're able to see that um as we were talking about the different perceptions like you know one person might be looking up at the clouds one person might be looking at the sand um it's it becomes really apparent when um like i know we talk about surrounding yourself with with the five people who have the um, most expansive influence you know maybe the the five people you admire most and start distancing from people who do not exhibit traits that we want to exhibit it becomes really apparent when they're when they start projecting and you can see that's not me i don't know what world you're projecting sounds like you're talking to yourself and we all do it um we all anytime i've projected i've sat and be like okay what what am i living in what is my perception of the world right now that i'm pointing my finger at someone else and making them the villain in my story. Um, it, anytime, anytime we're projecting or any, telling ourselves a story where there's a villain and a protagonist, it's a wonderful opportunity to get really clear on the world we, ex we are experiencing because what's, whatever's on the inside, we're gonna see on the outside. So if I'm focused, I actually experience this a lot because I am so focused on what is helpful for empaths and you know the, the medicine for empaths and i will be um talking with a fellow empath about the patterns in her life and then attract the same patterns because i'm doing investigative work and then so so i'll see it showing up everywhere um and yeah it's um and when i and i do find that when i kind of leave that world and, and I'm in my own world where, um, like I experienced it when I was falling in love in the spring, I was like, I'm just gonna be here. Like there's no drama, it's just bliss, this is great. However, I was out of touch with the, um, the daily struggles that, you know, our, our tribe experiences and the, um, 
the struggles of vampire and empath relationships and so couldn't be there forever and still be completely in service to the the people I like to help it does help every time I experience a return of you know anytime an energy vampire comes into my life and I go through all those same patterns it's actually when I produce the most helpful information so yeah, yeah. gotta feel it to heal it exactly that that's exactly what it is you gotta feel it to heal it because if we experience joy every single moment of every single day of our life that would not be fun no seeking grief and pain and loss and suffering because i mean that really like that's how humans are we want to have what we don't have or what we think we don't have people with straight hair want curly hair people with curly hair want straight hair people with blue eyes might want green eyes right um and so on and on and on we always want what we don't have and i mean i i've learned that if i'm able to recognize what i want that means the only way i'm I'm able to recognize it because I have it. And all I've got to do is actually strengthen that muscle, exercise it. It's like when you, one day you realize that you're out of shape and you want to get in shape. You were in shape before, so you had it, and you lost it or weren't aware that you were in shape. And all of a sudden now you've, you're in a place where you recognize that you want to get in shape. So which means that you have the ability to have it. So you do what is right for your body to get yourself into the shape and the body shape that you want. Same thing with these other things that we want to have, whether it's a skill, whether it's a thought, whether it's um, our presence, we can work on it. Mm -hmm. Once we are aware of what we want, we can work on it, strengthen it, and then embody it. Embody it, that's it right there. The embodiment is is the key um, really to all of this. Like as we're talking about, you know, creating the world we wish to see. That's what being the change, being the change is, it's embodying it. So for example, empaths who have a connection to peace and joy and truth, we can embody that. And that actually influences the world around us more than we realize. So going back to the patterns of expressing truth and then being silenced. The result of that pattern has led to a, a conditioned behavior for me where if I go to express my truth where I have just a feeling that I'm alone in, in this belief, I brace I, I, I still express, but I minimize myself and brace for impact and therefore attract the same result, a reason to brace. I, I expect a reason to brace for impact, so I brace and therefore I attract a reason, that reason. Whereas maybe if I, you know, fluffed my feathers a bit and stood straight and did not expect impact did not ex expect any retaliation whatsoever it maybe if that wasn't even part of my story anymore then it wouldn't happen you know i don't know mm -hmm. we'll find out i guess that's my my karma that's my but i gotta figure out how to show up and express and expect to be heard with love um that's part of our work and so yeah embodying it so embodying um this is why i love um so it's so fun because we're both doing a lot of being in groups right now so my group is we're just exploring default tendencies um but something yeah i mean some I, i'm i'm excited for my group to get to the theater technique so we can um you know practice that embodiment and showing showing up as our highest selves and seeing how much that affects the world around us yeah no um there, there is a there's a lot of incredible tools in the law of being 
that can like everything that we covered today i have gone through and the law of being was that tip of the iceberg that has helped me to work through all of these things that i mentioned um throughout this this conversation um and I, now as i'm looking at time I'm like ooh, this is <laughs> this is <laughs> we went for it <laughs> Yeah, I actually have another call that uh, that I have. So we're going to quickly wrap this up. I know we we mentioned in the beginning that we're going to talk about uh, living in sync with nature instead of against it. And we didn't cover that topic. Um, so what I'll do is actually I will redirect uh, those of you um, that are watching this on YouTube to another video that I did with Bethany, which was, uh, let me quickly pull it up. It's called six segments of Ayurvedic day and how it affects our well-being, circadian rhythms. So I'll probably add it to the to the end of it, if I remember. And if not, you can search it now that I mentioned the title to you. Um, and six is spelled out six, it's not a number six. That will cover a lot of, it basically it's bro broken down, the whole entire day, 24 hours broken down into six parts. And you see how each one, how our body, what it goes through. And you might start to recognize um, what is um, throwing you off balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So other than that, I uh, thank you, Rachel, for being such an awesome, awesome guest as always. <laughs> yeah and thank you everyone for listening and watching um if you like what you what you hear and what you see please share with somebody else who might benefit from it or whether it's a person or uh, a community and you find that there's a lot of helpful information in here please share that um because we do take a lot of our time of the day as you can see we've been on here for what two hours now um and we really give all that we possibly can and all of this is available for free because we know how helpful this information is not just for ourselves but uh for anyone yeah really for the community yeah exactly so thank you thank you thank you um everybody and thank you rachel and we will do this again next yeah. week one day Looking forward to it as always Awesome. Okay. Thank you. And until next time. Until next time. Bye. Bye.